Hi everyone, it's great to uh, be with you today um, and uh, thank you for your time. I'm especially Im uh, impressed if you've already done day's work uh, and looking at the chat, we've got people from all over the world. So a huge welcome to you. Um, so this is, the, this is the content for today's session. We're going to do a introductory activity. We're going to look at uh, some primary investigations, lessons learned, uh, secondary investigations, summary, and then a Q&A. Um, but of course, an overlap that the primary and secondary are not uh, mutually exclusive. They, they link a lot. I'm going to talk about some things I've done as a stage five science uh, teacher uh, here in the Middle East. And Claire is going to be looking at some secondary. Um, so over to um, Claire for the introductory activity. Yeah, it's lovely to be working across the world. And as, as you say, so many people from so many different places. And I think we've all had different experiences. So please do add your your comments as, as we go through the um, session. But we're going to start by interacting a little bit with you using a Mentimeter. Um, and so I'm hoping that you've got um, a device that you could use, maybe a mobile phone or um, on your um, computer. If you could log in to um, menti.com. Uh, it's also being put a link for you in the uh, chat and then you need to type in the code uh, on the screen that's 55182405 uh, and the first question that you'll find that we would like to um, have a bit of a brainstorm are um, three household items that you've been uh, thinking about using or have been using at home during practical activities so if you could um, log on to the Mentimeter and uh, let's have a look and see how many different things people have been using around the world to do practical work while they've been at home. <clears throat> oh, candle's a good one. Uh, yeah, we'll definitely be talking about that a bit further down. We won't be, uh, Richard. And, um, Yes, a ruler, definitely we have at home and at school. Um, uh, let's see sure, what yeah, yeah. There's lots of things we can use. I'll let a few more people add. A uh, tea strainer, that's a fun one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm liking the bathtub. <laughs> yeah, leaves, towel, tissue, straws. Yes. Yeah, lots of stuff. And the hand sanitizer is a nice new one. Uh, I hadn't thought about using hand sanitizer. You've given me an idea there. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I see coffee is in there. <laughs> torches are good as well, yes. Or a I was mentioning torches. Yeah, and cardboard boxes. Yes, we, we almost always can find a cardboard box to do something in science. <clears throat> I think uh, the reason for for doing this is I don't know how many of you listened to uh, Rhonda's talk um, a couple of weeks ago now, um, but she was sort of thinking about our planning when we're doing working from home. And I think that when we're working from home, um, sometimes we think about the things that we can't do uh, rather than the things that we can do. And uh, it's really quite useful to sometimes just walk around the house and think, what, what things do my students have that I could use even though I'm not in my normal laboratory? Uh, and I see that there's chemicals, so vinegar is a good one, and baking soda, <laughs> and sugar and salt, absolutely. Brilliant. Okay, so I think what we'll do is move on to the next question if we if we can. Um, so uh, the next question, question will um, ask you to uh, rank some activities. So um, I'm not sure how many people might have already started doing this. So if you can um, rate these activities um, for in-school uh, science lessons. So how much effort are you needing to put in as a teacher versus how much impact is it having on the learning in your classes? So we've got a few different types of activities there. Uh, demonstrations by teachers, demonstrations by students, videos, online simulations, minds on activities which for me mean thinking about it rather than necessarily doing it so a thought experiment and then hands on activities so uh see if you can um have a go at ranking those uh, and rating them for yourselves 
I can see at the moment that the minds on activity is thinking to have the least impact on learning, but uh, as everybody votes, they will move, move about. Hands on activity definitely coming out on top at the moment as being most impactful for um, teachers, but actually not the most effort. The, the video of a practical activity at the moment is suggesting that's not the most effort. <clears throat> Demonstration by the students, obviously the least for the teacher, uh, sort of superficially, certainly, yeah. Richard, has that been your experience to um, have uh, hands-on activities having the greatest impact on your learners, do you think? Definitely, definitely. Uh, and enjoyment, you know, yes. and, 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 and also variety, you know, th th there's lots of good software out there and 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 uh, the students in 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 primary have been doing lots of reading lots of maths sometimes the science has been a little bit neglected in some schools um and i think you know certainly my experience is that the both the students and the and the parents have really valued uh, getting away from a computer and doing something practical uh and 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 moving about and really thinking hard can we move on to the next question? So this is the next question. We were wondering what your thoughts were um, is about um, uh, uh, ranking. Um, what do you think are the decisions that you need to make when you are um, deciding against uh, delivering practical work? So when you decide, actually, this is not worth my effort, I should do something else in this lesson with my students, what are the things that are sort of the main reasons why perhaps we aren't doing practical work um, while we in this remote uh, learning environment. <laughs> so we'll give everybody a chance to, to give a sense there of what, what their experience has been at the moment. It seems that access um, of students' equipment is the, the most um, key reason why we not. And I'm quite interested to see and pleased to see that it being time consuming is not something that's a problem to us that much. Uh, and certainly um, planning practical work from home definitely is time consuming, so it certainly is a factor. <laughs> yeah, and I think one thing that we found is that one of the goals of, of the home learning uh, and, and one of the objectives is that the students become more independent and uh, I've certainly seen that even even in the primary children that there's been a shift where I think yeah. you know as, as the year has gone on actually uh, they're taking more responsibility and 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 uh, suggesting things so that actually the effort from the teacher is kind of not necessarily uh, as high as it was. No it's been really useful to reflect. Can we go on to the next question uh, and see what um, your thoughts are about um, <clears throat> Uh, our next question on the Mentimeter, which is uh, about your experience of practical work uh, compared to how things are in the school environment. So if you think it's the same, then uh, you can drag the bar right across to the right hand side. And if you think uh, uh, it's um, none, then over to the left hand side. So your experience of uh, engagement in the online um, versus uh, in school, the number of practical activities you've done compared to what you normally do in school, if you've done none or if you've done as many as, and then the success um, of those practical activities that you've done so far. So it looks like there is definitely a reduction in the amount of practical yeah. work that's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but the engagement, um, this so, impacted than the number of practicals we have been doing perhaps. Mm. But the engage engagement's high, you know, you know students yeah. do like students do like to do uh, science ac uh, activities and the, eff the effort in planning them is often well worth it. Yeah, that's been my experience too, Richard, and I think actually one of the things that's been really noticeable to me is that at school we're very constrained by the lesson ends at this time and the practical needs to really fit within this period um, and a lot of my students at home have gone on and, and done more exploratory work after 
uh, setting them off with a task. So, so that's been really interesting. Can we move on to the next um, question, I think, which is the last on our set of questions for you to uh, have a go at. Oh, that was the last one. Uh, so thank you very much for that uh, and your thoughts um, there. I'm passing over to Richard um, for some examples from the primary. Great, uh, and thank you everyone for your contributions. That's really interesting. Obviously, we planned this uh, over the last month, uh, and, and obviously we didn't know what you were going to say because uh, it's live uh, and it's interesting. So we're going to link to that um, uh, with that. You know, obviously with uh, primary science and secondary science, um, you know, as as Claire was saying, one of the key things is to think about what you ha you do have, not not what you don't have. Uh, and I made a little look similar to your list in terms of things that we've used over the last year uh, in stage five um, and that's been ice, salt, sugar, metal foil, torches, flashlights, mirrors, balls, balloons, sticks, soil, seeds, cotton wool, etc. So lots lots of things uh, and, and what I found is that the students have been very adaptable if they don't you know when you're in a classroom setting you tend to have you know everything the same standard stuff in online situations, it's, it's different, uh, but it's actually made it, um, it, and we'll explain a bit later, it, it, it's, it's presented different opportunities because people have been using different things. People have, have Students have had to think creatively, had to solve problems, and actually, they, they've actually put a lot of thought into how they can get around not having, you know, perhaps what uh, was the, the essential thing. So, you know, some of the things we, we, that we've talked about already, uh, from there, I think that I think the top three at the end on on the question on uh, on Mentimeter were uh, uh, resources uh, and equity, uh, instructions and engagement. So if we look, I was, I was again, these are some of the things that I was thinking about uh, beforehand. Uh, and obviously, when planning an activity from home, you're starting with the learning objective, but also this not just the knowledge and the understanding, but also the skills. There's lots of different practical activities that students can do. Uh, that, that develop the skills of science, not just the knowledge and understanding. Sometimes we get hooked on the knowledge and understanding. Uh, obviously, the learner's prior knowledge. Uh, resources available, which came top, I think, in the thing that you were thinking about. Uh, support at home uh, is, and, and parents' expectations. And that, and that varies very, you know, what are the community expectations in your particular environment? Uh, and they're different. What I found is, uh, like I mentioned earlier, is that actually the student in the level of independence has increased over the year, so that actually uh, parents uh, need to engage less, and, and they've appreciated that because they've seen the fact that the students are more independent and the students are enjoying the sessions. Um, obviously, you've got school policies, health and safety, all that kind of stuff as well. Uh, you need to be making sure you are following that. So we'll look at a, f uh, a few things that that you know we've done uh, that worked. Um, starters, yes, yeah, uh, safety is obviously very important. Um, so active learning, so, so uh, these are some of the starters that we've done um, this year for the, at the beginning of online science uh, lessons, uh, particles dance which you can do face to face uh, where the children kind of uh, mirror or imagine that they are solids, liquids or gases. And they are solids, they don't move very much, then they get a bit more energy, they heat up and, and they turn into liquids and move around a bit more. And then gases, they're, they're free to move all over the place. And the children like doing that. And you know, you, 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 we can, that can be done uh, on an online setting, depending on, on your school policies of, of communication. Uh, a treasure hunt we did also when we were looking at a, a topic on light. So at the beginning of a lesson, um, we asked, uh, I asked the children to go and find two opaque objects, two translucent objects, two transparent objects, and then bring them back to the screen to show. Um, and, and that worked well. It, 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 it got children thinking and moving, and that was a good bit of formative assessment as well. A particular favorite, I don't know if you know the game Charades, it's probably got different names in different parts of the world. Uh, Charades is a game where you act out different um, phrases or words. And we used it quite a lot in for, for science, for acting out vocabulary and processes. Uh, so for example, uh, we've done uh, things like the word energy, and, and one child acts out the word energy without talking, 
and the rest have to guess what the word is. And they've, they've enjoyed that and the challenge of that. And we've also done things like life cycle, water cycle, uh, orbit, uh, planet, reflect, all, all sorts of different words um, that, that they've enjoyed acting out. Um, again, depending on, on your technology and your communication policies from the school, but it's worked well in this particular um, context. The other thing is um, that, that, you know, design their own starter for the next lesson. So quite often, at the, uh, you know, towards the end of a lesson, we'll take it in turns to, to think of, of, a, of, of a recap activity that the students can plan for the beginning of the next science lesson. Um, and they've done this in lots of different ways. Uh, some of them have done like a, a Google slide. Some of them have done a picture. Some have even done a little video. Some have, uh, uh, have taken things off the internet. Some have um, uh, uh, created a quiz on Kahoot or whatever, loads of different software. And again, that's a nice activity. It's, it's passing some responsibility over to the students. And you're also get gauging an uh, engagement and also uh, the responsibility and also a bit of formative assessment. So that's worked well, you know, giving them the responsibility to start the next lesson online uh, has worked well uh, with, with this age of, of students. And so I'm, I'm just going to go through one of one of the activities that we did. This was uh, stage five on evaporation and condensation. Um, I think the second highest um, concern that, that you, we had as a group was about uh, students following instructions. Um, and and this was towards the end of the school year. This was fairly recently, uh, and so they'd had quite a lot of experience of doing um, you know science from home. And, and, and in our context, we've been at home um, all year. Um, so th the students have had uh, quite a lot of experience of this. Um, the way I I um, did a uh, did the instructions. The instructions were in text, uh, which you can see there in order. But also, I did this little diagram for you. I'm not sure if you like the quality of my diagram, uh, but this this was to help them uh, as they uh, as they set up their investigation. Um, and I think I did this on a jam board or something, uh, and share this with them, and it really helped. So, and and the students they found a bowl, uh, the you know the warm water. They put the drinking glass in the middle. They covered the whole thing with plastic food wrap, and then put some ice cubes on top of the food wrap above the drinking glass and what happened some of the water evaporated uh, it couldn't escape it couldn't escape into the room so it uh, and then when it uh, touched the cold surface under the ice cubes it condensed so the drinking glass the empty drinking glass filled up with some water and it was a nice little activity uh, that the students managed to do and i, I i've got a few uh, photographs but it, but we did you know lots of other things obviously in biology at primary level we were growing uh, seeds mung beans which are, which were commonly available from the shops uh, we were looking at investigations to do with water light warmth temperature that kind of thing uh, in, in physics we were looking at light we did shadow sticks investigating shadows different times of the day uh, and this kind of stuff so there was a lot of, a lot of different things that we were doing um, and, 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 you know, one of the points that was made, I think the third most important point was about engagement. Um, and it, you know, the, what, what we found again was that the, the, the amount of time that the students could concentrate increased. You know, they, they, were, they were taking uh, responsibility for their, um, for their actions uh, and that increased. Um, see that they have a photograph of one of the students who, who completed this investigation. Um, I think one thing in primary science, sometimes there's a temptation that we have to, you know, record what happened in a book. And I, I'm not sure that's always necessary. Um, and, you know, online, we can, you, you, again, depending on your school policies and technology, but you can use drawings, uh, technology drawings, photos, videos, um, you can annotate on slides. Um, so, you know, the, the students enjoy it. And again, you know, we can reflect on what they what, what they've done uh, without having to necessarily do a, a formal write up every time. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges I found and, and I'm, I'm sure some of you have is that it, when students are in a classroom, you can see how they're doing. You can see when they're struggling. You can see when they understand something because of their body language, because of their uh, you know the eye contact. You can see all these things. It's much harder um, 
in, in an online setting. Um, it's easy to keep children busy in a way, engaged, and some of the software uh, that's available is very good at getting children engaged, but we have to be a little bit more discerning about how much learning they're doing. Uh, so here are some of the things that you know we did you know, to try to gauge that, and it's hard. It, I think this was one of the hardest things was adjusting as a teacher um, according to what the students are doing. So, you know, discussion, photographs, diagrams, voice notes, platforms, polls, breakout rooms, think fair share. Uh, and I, I see in, in chat people using Jamboard, which is, which is great because it's very live. You can give feedback, can't you? So there's, there's lots of opportunities for that. But how you adjust to what's going on uh, is, is hard sometimes and, and uh, when you're not there. Um, so here's just a few lessons that um, you know that, that, that we found, or you know, with, with, with our students. Um, you know, active learning is the goal, and thinking hard, not not just being active. It's pretty easy to get students active, but the the learning and the thinking hard is, is was the challenge. Um, as Claire hinted at earlier, when you, when you're actually in a classroom, you tend to do a more standard investigation with students, uh, and when students were at home. Actually, we found that there, there was all sorts of different <laughs> differences and errors, but these were opportunities to, to, to learn and, and, and overcome. And the students were really creative as to ways to get around things and asking questions, you know, why did something work in one context, why did it not? Um, parents, in my experience, you know, the, the communication was key. We planned to start the year with some small wins and then we built upon that. Uh, but the parents really, you know, the feedback was they they really appreciated the fact that the students became more independent and the students were engaged and the students were thinking about what they're doing and crucially were having time away from the screen. Um, health and safety, obviously, you need to you need to follow uh, policies and, and, and whatever your boss says. Uh, planning we've talked about. Also, the fact that we don't necessarily, we found you don't always need to do whole investigations uh, at home. You can do part, part of investigations um, as well. Uh, and engagement and enjoyment, that was a really big thing. Uh, I, I know from colleagues in other schools that science has kind of disappeared a little bit, some primary science, which is really sad. Um, you know, the world needs good scientists now more than ever. And, you know, there's a lot of research that says that, you know, children kind of decide by the time they leave primary school, if they want to pursue science as a career or not. Um, so it's our, our kind of responsibility in a way to, to try to, you know, um, to provide enjoyment, a, a engagement, and of course, meaningful science. And, and the more meaningful it is, the more progress they make, the more they're going to be motivated. Um, so, you know, when, when they really are thinking and, and they figure something out, um, that, that's motivating. Um, and like I said, the parents really appreciated the, the activities. Um, one of the things that we didn't think about at the beginning, but what we what, what you realized was that there was a, the, the, a metacognitive element to to the online learning was actually quite high in that, um, you know, actually, as Claire mentioned before, when you're in a classroom, you know, metacognition involves uh, planning an activity based on, on your cognition, your, your, you know, your, your own knowledge, skills and understanding, monitoring it and, and then evaluating it, you know, towards the end. And often the evaluating is, is, is the weak part of the process. It's the weakest link. Um, but actually online, we found that the evaluating has been quite strong and, and there's been some really good metacognition going on. Um, taking it, And again, I, I've, I've put there, if, if there's anything you found in terms of good questions to ask uh, students, because it's, it's those questions uh, and different, you know, different questions for different people. Um, I, I've got some ideas on the next slide. Um, but this, um, you know, th this ability to kind of think metacognitively and evaluate what they've done certainly was a strength of the online science lessons uh, with, the, with the active lessons. Um, so, you know, here are a few, you know, you, 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 can, um, you, can, you can break metacognition into kind of before, during and after. At the beginning, you know, is the objective clear? Uh, is, it, is the task something similar to something I've seen before? It's really important, making connections. And again, with metacognition, one's, one of the goals is, is student independence and taking responsibility for, for yourself. Um, you know, during an, an activity or a problem or an investigation, you know, are you on the right track? Can I try a different approach? That, uh, that, that uh, changing, uh, changing approach. And also, what can I use for help or who can I use for help? Looking at resources and people, 
But the, the, the big thing for us was these afterwards questions. You know, how did the practical work help you learn today? You know, they were finding out about how they learn and and adding to their toolkit as a learner. They were like thinking, oh yeah, I, I found this learning quite powerful. And then the next question was, how can then you can you apply this learning to a different context? Not just in science, maybe math, maybe art, whatever it is. And we found there's a real depth there. Uh, so that 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 you know, in a way, we kind of didn't plan that, but it it, it certainly come out. Uh, and 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 the evaluation part of the metacognition for us has been a strength. Uh, and also as a teacher, you know, metacognition. You know, are we reflecting on what we've done? The the link between effort and success we just talked about in in the mentee. Um, you know, are 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 we just hoping to go back to to normal? Mm, but I think we could have grown from this. Um, standards, not standardization. Uh, learning from mistakes. And I think the most powerful thing, and not everyone does this, but I know a few teachers who I work with have actually kept a diary, and they've literally just written one or two sentences a a day, and they have found this massively powerful in terms of reflecting on what they are doing. You know. Um, you know, we're all very, very busy as teachers, but to find just a couple of minutes to to reflect on what you've done, uh, they found it incredibly powerful, and, and and they've suggested that that was actually one of the most powerful things, because unfortunately we forget what we do, don't we? And and although we we, we do improve as we go along, I think a diary um, has been really useful for some people. So Claire, over to you. Thank you very much, Richard. And, and I think what's really sort of um, been interesting watching the um, the chat as, as you've been going along is, is, is how much overlap there is between uh, the comments that you've been making about uh, what happens in the primary context and, and that in secondary as well. And I've seen some, some people giving some great ideas about what they've done in their classrooms, both uh, for primary and for secondary. So although I'm going to now focus on some of the secondary examples, um, certainly uh, I think that the the ideas and the the, um, the the thought processes behind them are very similar for primary. Uh, what I thought I would do is is take three examples: uh, one from uh, physics, then a chemistry one, and then a biology one, um, and then we could do a little bit of um, thinking about uh, each of the sciences and perhaps um, certainly what we might have done in in those different uh, contexts. So I pulled out um, from the IGCSE syllabus. Um, a statement off the physics um, syllabus uh, and I chose at random to pick up um, the idea about um, moments, the principle of moments and um, centre of mass, uh, which is definitely something we do um, on a practical um, level. Um, so my questions really to you and, and please do add your comments into the chat are going to be uh, if this was you and you were doing some planning for this experiment what equipment do you think your students might have at home to do it? What would be the safety precautions that we would need to consider for them doing it at home? Um, and then I think particularly um, of a concern sometimes is, is how we might assess um, how much they've really understood. And that's um, sometimes something that we feel that we can only gauge so much when we're in the classroom with them, but when we're not able to be with them physically, how is it that we can um, assess their understanding of something that they're doing practically in their home and, and you are not with them? Uh, and also some ideas about how to extend that task. So I'm, I'm wondering if anyone has done uh, this experiment at home and um, what they did, what um, things they used and, and how they got their students to, to have any success at home. Uh, I think the um, the standard experiment is to to piece, make a piece of card and and to get a um, a plumb line, so to have a piece of string or, or wool or something with something heavy um, at the bottom of it, and then to um, uh, position it in different um, places along the card and draw a line down to get the centre of mass. And um, certainly, I think the experience is that the students could do that um, at home. Um, we would need to think a little bit about um, what they could use in terms of cardboard and, and what's um, safe for them to use and this idea of string and what would be sensible in terms of how heavy a mass to use on the end so that they're not um, hurting themselves. Um, I like your idea, Amira, of them displaying their experiments on the um, screen. Um, I think 
this is a case where actually videos on or at least taking photographs and uploading them uh, is definitely useful. Uh, and uh, then some questions and answers um, are definitely useful as well in terms of um, extending their understanding. Um, so I thought about this one and I really thought um, what, I, what I mentioned to you in the beginning was um, this idea that actually we're not so constrained by the lesson time when we're at home. And um, what we could do um, is to, to extend that task that perhaps we might not have done if we were doing this um, in lesson time. And so um, I, I thought about the idea of um, the toys that are often relying on this idea of center of mass. And I got some students to, to make an, a, a toy uh, that shows center of mass. Um, and I wonder if the um, uh, events managers could just help me by putting the camera on now because I've got them um, with me here live. Um, and so I could show you um, what I'm doing um, literally um, here in my, uh, in my room. <clears throat> so I've moved over to the other side of my desk um, and um, here are some of the, the things that um, I made. I don't know. Is that still on the main screen, or can you can you see me large on the um, on the video? <clears throat> um, well, hopefully, hopefully you can see it a little bit at least. Um, so this was one of the things that my one of my students made. She she brought it in afterwards, which was a um, treble cliff. Um, and so um, we were looking at um, the centre of mass of something that was quite an unusual shape. Um, some of them decided to make. Um, parrots that they could hang on their fingers um, and so this was one and and she realized she needed to add a weight to the bottom and found um, a clip um, and this student um, made a, me uh, a lovely butterfly that sort of hung on the bottom of her finger um, and again um, what it meant was that she really discovered the idea about center of mass and to in order for it to hang uh, she needed to play around with the um, blue tack and uh, the opportunity for them to really just explore on their own and, and really take that concept of, OK, we've done the practical, but actually, um, can we take that forward and, and really think about how to apply it? Meant that I really realized that the students had understood uh, a center of mass when, when I've been able to see them uh, show me what they had been ma making. Um, another student um, found a little um, plastic round um, structure from some, some old toy um, and put something heavy in the bottom of it um, so that um, it, um, it kept always falling back up to the top. And then you can see um, that I, I have a tin over here which I uh, teased the students about and hung on the edge of my bench and asked them to predict at what point it would tip over and fall um, and then opened it up and showed them that what I'd done inside was actually to and put a whole lot of very heavy uh, Play-Doh plasticine um, in the one side of the tin. And that meant that um, it wasn't um, going to fall over. So although I didn't have all my equipment at home either, um, there are actually ways that if you can just think a little bit outside the box, um, you can um, do that. Um, I can see that um, Shirley has mentioned about the idea of doing it with a, a fork um, and some spoons. Absolutely, um, you you can do that as well. Um, I had a student definitely that had hung um, two forks on the side of the glass. Um, uh, plates would be interesting. Um, uh, I, 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 I hope that they definitely weren't plates that were going to break. But um, yes, uh, that would be um, a key one. So just back to the slides then. Um, if we move over to um, some ideas for chemistry, uh, I noticed somebody earlier mentioned about doing um, chemistry with uh, photograph. Uh, paper chromatography um, on leaves, um, but I was also thinking about it in terms of this statement in chemistry, um, where the students needed to understand um, their, their thinking about um, uh, paper chromatography. Um, and uh, so I was thinking about how to do this practical with some students um, at home. Um, same things, what equipment would, would they need? Um, what safety precautions should they consider? Um, how can I be sure that they've actually understood and assessed their learning? And, and again, how could, could I um, extend that? Um, and it was the extension um, that I really went for in this one was towards art. So it was really interesting, Joel, that you've mentioned about um, uh, extension to art, because I think the creativity and innovation in science is something that we can really tap into while they're at home. 
um, and, and let them extend further from what they normally do. Um, so my example um, for the, um, the chemistry one um, was to allow them to, to do the standard um, practical with um, a glass and um, I asked them to find some of their uh, colored pens at home and they put some paper down and did the normal sand experiment. Um, but to actually in this case, I think we did it sort of as a demonstration to, together in the, in the classroom. Uh, and then I said to them, could they make me um, some art from their chromatography? Um, and gave them a few ideas. Um, so I had made a few um, different sort of little ones um, myself ahead um, and cut them out and, and thought about them. Um, and um, I, I've just done a sort of one over here with a bowl. So uh, it's got a bowl and a coin in the bottom. And um, it's amazing how good paper towel is from the kitchen um, or even a toilet roll will work uh, rather than filter paper. Um, and it was so interesting to me when I did this experiment um, that uh, a lot of the students said to me, oh, they went away and did something and then came back and, and exactly what's happened to my uh, paper towel here happened is that the um, colored ink had run right off to the edge of the paper and they had to start again um, because um, uh, they hadn't um, stopped it in time. And I think that is something that um, sometimes we, um, forget in science is that we give them so many instructions to follow um, that if you just say to them have a go um, and, and make something creative with chromatography um, they sometimes do a lot more learning they realized about the touching of the sides and how that made the speed at which um, the uh, ink travel change they realized that it was going to go off the edge if they didn't stop it and, and take it out um, and all of that learning um, was so invaluable um, and, and I think the idea of asking them to do something uh, in terms of art sort of gave those students that sometimes lack the um, enthusiasm to participate and the energy to do it sort of an incentive um, to have a go at doing something because they quite liked being able to, to create something perhaps different um, and so um, yes um, definitely just doing the standard on a small piece of paper going up and, and calculating RF values is important, but, but so is the exploratory uh, learning. <clears throat> to move back over to my desk now, um, you can um, see my face. Um, but um, uh, I like your comment there, Amira, about them doing a, a preliminary test beforehand um, and some tips to give them before they go off and do the main one, particularly when you're going to do something that perhaps has got some potential risks to do with it. So um, the paper chromatography and the pens, usually nothing much goes wrong. Certainly they've got a pair of scissors, so that would be something to just to, for them to consider, but otherwise um, quite, quite straightforward for them to do. Um, so going on then to um, an idea for biology. Um, in this case, I pulled out um, an example that's from the section on diffusion where they've been asked to look at um, surface area, temperature and concentration gradients or and distance um, as variables um, for diffusion. And um, I know that I'm sure a lot of you could think of all sorts of experiments that we could do for diffusion. Um, and I thought about this one quite hard. Um, I was at home and wondering how to enable my students to engage with it. And I actually went um, for something a little bit radical and said to them, I'm going to give you free reign. Um, you can do any experiment that you might like to do. Um, and so I didn't say to them, uh, you need to go and find these things from home and have them in front of you. Um, I, I, I want you to think about what demonstrations you can do to show me that uh, you can do diffusion. Uh, those of you that were with us last week when we were doing the panel discussion will know that I'm a real fan of thinking maps. Uh, and so I asked my students to make a thinking map for me of that. Um, and um, I, I gave them the instruction then just to use anything in their house to uh, plan their method. And this was one of the thinking map plans that one of my students came up with. So um, they were working interactively together, um, and this was her initial plan. Uh, she was going to use a coffee grain and um, put it in some cups of water and then measure how far the coffee grain uh, was visible. Uh, and so what I asked them to do at that point was to swap their plans with each other and to give each other uh, some comments 
if they weren't sure that they could follow their own instructions. Uh, so this is some comments from another student on the student's um, uh, flow map. Um, the student asked her how much water should she add, um, where could they find, uh, where should she place the coffee grain. So different things that the, 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 the second student wasn't really sure about uh, from the first student's uh, instructions. So the, the first student went back, added some more detail about um, what they should do. So um, just, uh, how much water to add, how they were going to take um, measurements with some photographs. And they realized then uh, that they needed to um, think about distance and, and graph paper underneath uh, being a way that they could record how far the um, puppy um, uh, had moved from, from the middle. Uh, when they got to that point, and the two students themselves were quite happy that they could both follow each other's methods, um, they sent them to me. And I said to them, yes, you're OK, uh, but now you need to tell me which of those variables, surface area, temperature, concentration, gradient, or distance, uh, are you going to measure? And so the student went back and uh, modified her, her flow map some more uh, and added in to uh, look at concentration by adding more coffee granules each time she did it. And so um, once she had got to that point, um, we just asked her to check about um, the risks. Um, and um, that she had um, her parents' permission to use that equipment, and off she went and did that experiment. And so I think that the, the key thing here was actually not to give them the instructions, but actually for them to realize that they could think about the instructions that they're going to do, particularly if your students are all going to do different experiments, um, actually giving them, please go and find these things at home. I noticed somebody up in the beginning um, of our conversation this morning said about, um, that some of the students didn't have some of the equipment that they wanted, some styrofoam cups or something. If you if you give them free reign, actually they, they really love the idea about can I test anything? Um, and, and they came up with so many different ideas themselves um, that um, I came back with a lot more than um, I was expecting from, from letting them do this. But the scaffold of please write your method up first and then can somebody follow your method and what are you changing? Um, was definitely um, a really good way um, for the students to, to think about um, how to do um, experiments and, and to get something slightly different out from them. Uh, I just wanted to add in um, that the other thing that I've used a lot um, while we've been um, at home uh, is, is my mobile phone and my students using their mobile phones. Um, there's a lot um, of features inside a mobile phone which make them really, really uh, useful as tools for taking measurements um, and recording things. Obviously, they can be used as a timer um, and uh, the camera can be used to record things. I saw somebody said about Flipgrid. Absolutely, Flipgrid is one of my favorite. Um, and um, the events team have just popped up their Firefox for you. Um, that's um, an app that's free to, to teachers um, and has a lot of tools in it um, that enable you to take measurements. Uh, you can measure the height of balls bouncing off the floor from the sound um, in the mobile phone. Um, you can also um, put it uh, attached to um, some structure that you move and that uses the geospatial location to, to find speed of travel and acceleration. So in fact, there's some amazing experiments you can just do with the mobile phone. Um, and um, the Science Journal um, with Google linked it as well also has quite a few ideas with some small short videos uh, to help you um, work out how to do those um, experiments. So um, don't forget that most students also um, are very adept at um, technology, um, sometimes more than we are, and, and using their mobile phones is also a really good way uh, to get them involved in some practical work from home. Uh, I think I'm going to pass back over to um, Richard now, who's going to um, have a look at some other things that we should perhaps consider. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, just, just a few points as, as we get towards the end. Um, there are some fantastic uh, virtual museum visits that you can do, lots of good science museums around the world uh, to, to consider. Um, you know, I don't encourage too much YouTube, but you may or may not know that if you put a hyphen between the T and the U in the, uh, in the URL of in the word YouTube, you get ad free play and you um, uh, so that uh, can, can be helpful sometimes when playing YouTube videos. That works at the moment. I don't know how long that will work for. One thing that, that uh, I, 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 
<laughs> one thing Sorry, I, Richard, I, I was just going to interrupt you there and just say that I, I, one of the um, panelists last week was saying that she actually quite likes making her own videos for her students mm. to actually see that they're not perfect yeah. um, and that you can you can sometimes actually make a better video yourself um, just because you know your students and and the types of things that they've got in front of them rather than a YouTube clip and and not to be afraid to also just make your own videos. Um, yeah. I don't know if the events team can have got that, but I think there's a little um, video that you can watch of, of that um, teacher and and how she's been engaging with her students. Mm. Sorry, sorry, Richard. <laughs> no, no problem at all. And and uh, you know, it, it's a really good point because I think I think you know you, you, we can be lazy sometimes using YouTube uh, and it doesn't always fit. Um, um, the, the, that third point there about replanning the curriculum over a two-year time period, I think, is is an important one because there are actually some things that are better done at school. Uh, you yeah. know, we've been talking about all these great uh, activities they can do, and there's also an, an issue uh, an issue of equity. Not everyone, not every student, will be be able to have access to some of these things. So, from from a primary perspective, I got two pleas, uh, and it uh, which linked to secondary as well. The first plea is that. You know, when there are handover meetings at the end of years, primary teachers tend to focus on reading results. They tend to focus on math scores. My plea would be to to make sure that science gets a good mention there, so that you know students who may may not have had uh, the, the same uh, opportunities at home don't just get ignored. Uh, and also that if if there's really good practical science that hasn't happened this year, you know, make sure you know you jiggle around the order of the curriculum so that it happens next year so have a think about that you know uh, within the context and maybe a two-year curriculum plan may work on that the other thing is that if you are uh, you know a secondary science specialist working in uh, an all through school you know to, to, to you know not all primary colleagues are are confident to do practical science investigations so you know to to, to share ideas and and, and to to give uh, the teachers the confidence to do things so that they don't overuse YouTube or they don't uh, overuse uh, websites would, would be really good, a really good point. Uh, Claire, fourth point. Yes, um, I can see that the events team have just popped another link up there for you, which is um, Kodak. Um, that's um, a resource that's got a, a lot of big data sets in them from all over the world and all sorts of different things. Um, and I think sometimes we, we think a lot about the hands-on, don't we, in terms of practical work. Have they done it? Have they um, engaged with the, the materials? But sometimes, um, certainly in secondary, um, sometimes it's actually the analysis of the data, the interpretation of a big data set and um, that can be really quite important too. So giving them um, a go at Kodak has also been really quite useful um, during lockdown where they can um, quickly draw and change and look at variables and see the impact on them. Uh, and the other thing that I think sometimes is also overlooked are, are thought experiments. I like the idea of minds on rather than just hands on. So um, are they thinking about the scenario Visualize, close their eyes. If you were doing this thing, what would happen? Um, I think that um, somebody mentioned that in the chat also a bit earlier. Um, the idea that um, one can actually just really think through what is going to happen if we did this, rather than actually do it. And sometimes uh, that in itself can can involve a lot of discussion and and good um, good um, thoughts. And and sometimes we just jump over the hypothesize. Um, what is what? What the result is going to be, and let them do it before they've actually even thought what what they're expecting to, to find. I think the classic example there was um, dropping um, a feather and a ball out of um, uh, a big tower, and which one's going to land on the floor first. Um, and if you really just think that through and allow the students to just engage with it, and why they might be different, and what what the um, factors are involved for those types of things, those thought experiments. Um, aren't necessarily I need to go and find this equipment at home and I must uh, do these experiments that are sort of on my list that I normally do in the laboratory but are just as invaluable um, to the science curriculum um, and sometimes perhaps overlooked when we're back in our labs um, because we just sort of go with what's safe um, and, and I think that that's um, an important point to make as well. Um, so I think that um, the last bit really is um, a lovely quote um, that um, we found um, I hear, I forget, I see, and I remember, I do, and I understand. And for me, the doing, as I've said, isn't just about hands on doing, but mind on doing as well. Mm 
Uh, Richard, uh, over to you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And, and just to summarise, you know, it, it's given us a great opportunity to, to, to look at things in a different way, learn, reflect, you know, uh, go through the metacognitive processes ourselves as teachers. So, uh, you know, m make the most of that. Um, the practical elements, of, obviously, we've been talking about all the time. And that collaboration with colleagues doesn't always happen. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's th that opportunity to share ideas, um, teachers, certainly primary teachers, we don't always say what we don't know. Uh, we tend to we tend to do the stuff we do know. Um, and you know, if you if you can encourage that collaboration, that would be really really useful. And of course, you know, the pandemic has highlighted the need for good great scientists. Uh, our approach and enthusiasm as teachers can have a massive influence. And I think that's something that you know is is really really important. I know you know we've got reading, we've got writing, we've got so many things to do. Um, but that, that, I think, is, is the final plea from my side. Um, great. And I think we've got f five minutes. If there, any there's, there were some really good uh, ideas and, and things, uh, suggestions and ideas in the chat. Claire, as you were, I was speaking, there was all sorts of stuff about diffusion and all, all sorts of exciting things. So thank you for that. Uh, has anyone got any other comments they want to make, questions or comments they want to share uh, just for the last couple of minutes of the session? Uh, but, but thank you for your time. I do really appreciate that because I know how busy teachers all over the world are. So, so a huge thank you for that. Um, while any other questions come up, do, do you share your um, thoughts as well? Uh, not just questions, but also your, I, I can see people have been sharing different things that they've been using um, themselves. I like the Google expeditions. They're absolutely brilliant. You're absolutely right where you can delve down into um, a completely different place that you are normally in. Um, Last week, um, somebody on the panel asked me about how to do um, microscope work from home, and of course that's um, nearly impossible. Um, but I have been using um, a, a really quite good um, resource um, at the link that I've just popped into the chat now. Um, so if that was you on the um, panel um, meeting last week, um, that, that's the resource that I've been using for my, doing microscope work. I think that certainly we've um, struggled a little bit in science since SASH has been um, discontinued um, and quite a lot of the interactive um, simulations um, have been um, uh, stopped because of that. Um, the, the websites that use them now don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, certainly uh, the, the one that I've put there for the microscope does work. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, somebody's written there about students that are quarantining at home and that you're still in this classroom. Um, yes, that is definitely um, a key factor um, because um, I've had that with a simulation, a, a, a sim simultaneously students in the classroom and the ones that are at home. And if they can uh, join with each other, um, this video from the other uh, science teacher, Karen Strauss, also shows um, a good example of doing that. Somebody's mentioned about um, the resources from Cambridge. Don't forget that Resource Plus um, is now freely available to all schools, and there's some really good videos and um, ideas of doing practical work that link directly to them on Resource Plus. Um, and yes, the RSC, um, that's a really good one for chemistry. I agree with you um, there. So um, thank you for, for that. In terms of time flexibility, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, that's a good one, Ray. Um, how, how much time to, to do for a practical um, and, um, and, and, and versus the theory? I think it's been something we've all struggled a little bit with. I, I'm certainly I'm not as far through the theory as I usually am at this point. Um, and I think that's the case for, for most teachers. Um, I guess it's, a really, it's, it's, it's something that you need to collectively agree as a school and as a department um, as to, to how much time to, to devote to different things. I think historically practical work is given uh, not enough time and so I would mm. imagine whoever one's doing more practical work is probably um, a good idea. Um, so yeah, the Exempt Event Scheme has put the link there for you um, for the um, support um, for teachers and that's got resource plus on it. So definitely go and have a look at that if you've not used it before. Uh, thank you for and the link for the you. table. In, in terms of time, sometimes you know, uh, you know, devoting more time to practical science can actually be a time saver because the mm -hmm. students are more motivated. They, you know, they they, they learn more skills. They're more, and actually, then the theory becomes easier because they've got something to hook onto it. 
so there's always the temptation, especially if, if, if you've got exams, you know, or, or, or assessments, you know, at the end of the tunnel to, to, to try to cram and try to focus on that. But it, 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 it can be a time saver because, you know, through that engagement, through that motivation. Also, you really do get a sense of what the students don't understand when you've done practical work um, because yeah. um, you can go through some theory and they can be listening but not really um, being able to take that internally. Uh, and when you, when you put that uh, into practical work, then um, that becomes um, much more something that you can really get a sense that they've understood what you've been doing. Yeah, and, and, and that depth of responses was, was my biggest surprise this year in terms of... It, 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 yeah, well, I wanted engagement, I wanted enjoyment, but actually the depth was was uh, really a really pleasant surprise. Great. So I, th I think that's about. Does that wrap it up? Any last questions? If there are any last uh, minute comments or, or or questions, do pop them in the chat. Uh, so um, otherwise, I think uh, we're we're just about wrapped up. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.